Hello, everyone, and welcome back for session two of our Summer Systematics Institute Research Symposium. Uh, for those of you just joining us for the afternoon session, uh, we just wanted to tell you a little bit about what the program is and why, why you're here joining. And for everyone in our live audience, you've already heard this spiel, so feel free to tune us out for the next <laughs> two minutes. Uh, the Summer Systematics Institute is a research program that's supported by the National Science Foundation. Uh, through the Research Experiences for Undergraduates program. It's been happening at the Academy continuously for 26 years. Give it up to the Academy. I think it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, uh, continuously operating RU site in the country. Um, probably most definitely the oldest in a natural history museum setting. Uh, and we're really excited because being a museum at the California Academy of Sciences, we have the unique opportunity of bringing research interns into our building, not only to engage in one-on-one -on -one research with one of our curators or scientists uh, here in our Institute for Biodiversity Science and Sustainability, but they also have the opportunity of interacting with all the other parts of this museum that make it as wonderful as it is, uh, including our public programs division, our science communication and digital engagement, um, and really every other nook and cranny of this institution and all the uh, fantastic people that make it run so seamlessly. Like, for example, our digital engagement team that's behind the scenes right now uh, running this live stream. So thank you, digital engagement team. Uh, <laughs> Rebecca and I are the co-directors of, of SSI. We, we took over the program. We were past the torch a, a couple of years ago. Um, and we are, I think, both really feel like this, this program is really important to the both of us because we were REU students when we were undergraduates. Uh, and that experience was really formative uh, in such a way that it guided us down the path of becoming biodiversity scientists and um, really continuing to engage in research. And, and this opportunity, this summer research program, I think for many people is the first time you ever get to do research um, and understand what it means to be a scientist. At least it was for me. Uh, and I hope for many of our interns, it's just the beginning of their path uh, with science, whatever that shapes out to be, whether it's doing science or communicating science or studying science and teaching about it. Uh, so um, with that, we have six wonderful presentations this afternoon. Uh, we moved one from the morning session. So if you were tuned in for John this morning, uh, and saw that we our computer crashed in the last presentation, as is predictable. Uh, we've got him teed up for the first uh, speaker this afternoon session. Um, and then we'll hear from everybody else as scheduled, just slightly delayed. Yeah, so we are super proud of our students. And I hope that you we enjoyed. If you didn't get a chance to watch the morning live stream, go back and watch it. It was amazing. Um, and. I hope you just enjoy learning about the research that they've done this summer um, and their experiences. And without further ado, we'll introduce John. Yeah, and if you have any questions along the way, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll be taking questions both from our live audience here, but also questions from those of you that are tuned in from home. Uh, so our first presentation is uh, John Wen, who's from Columbia University, and he'll be presenting on the diversity and distribution of reed frogs on Bioko Island in Equatorial Guinea. Uh, and his advisor was Dr. Raina Bell, our herpetologist. John, take it away. Great. Thank you, Lauren and Rebecca for the introduction. Hi everyone, I'm John Nguyen, and today I'll be talking to you all about a genus of frogs called Hyperolius um, from Bioko Island, Equatorial Guinea. But before I start, I'd like to thank the following people and institutions for supporting me throughout this project and the NSF for funding this program. Um, I've been having a blast in San Francisco and it's really thanks to everyone here and also people watching the live stream, so thank you. All right, so, Bioko is an island located off of the coast of Equatorial Guinea in Africa, and is one of four islands in the Gulf of Guinea archipelago. Um, Bioko is actually the youngest island of the four, the other three being oceanic islands. Um, but relative to its size and age, Bioko has very high diversity, and albeit low endemism because Bioko is a land-rich island. So this means that they're rising and retreating sea levels, cycles of this, um, that encourages 
movement and dispersal of animals from the continent to Bioka and vice versa. And Bioka is located on the equator, so it's a very tropical climate and there's ecosystems ranging from lowland forests to mountain rainforests. So Bioko is home to a genus of frogs called Hyperoleus, which is situated within the Hyperolidae family. Hyperolidae is endemic to Africa and is one of the main groups of tree frogs. And Hyperoleus is actually the most species rich genus in this family. So you can see there's 152 species and Hyperoleus takes up a majority of this phylogeny here. So, so, so specifically on Bioko, you can find four species of Hyperoleus um, two of them being unidentified and two of them being confirmed. So the first two confirmed species are Oscillatus and Tuberculatus, and then the two unidentified ones are HCF Fusca ventris and HCF Njami. CF simply meaning that there's some level of uncertainty with the species ID. So we'll get started with H. Oscillatus. And this species is found um, mainly on the continent of Africa in like the central region. And immediately you can see like the, the male on top and the female on the bottom. And immediately you can see how they vary in color patterns. So um, this is an example of sexual dichromatism where two species or two sexes in, within the same species are um, different in color variation. The next species, which is confirmed on Bioko is H. tuberculatus. And the species is also found in Central Africa. Again, the male and female are different. Oops. And the first unidentified species on Bioko is HCF fusca ventris. Um, the species is found um, in this low region in West Africa um, near like Benin and Togo. And again, male and female are different, look different. And then our last species is also unidentified HCF njami. And Njami is really special because um, it's an example of polymorphism. So there's variation in color pattern between the sexes, but there's also variation within a sex. So the females um, have different color patterns here, which makes it super confusing when it comes to um, species IDing. And you can also see how the males especially look alike, um, particularly Oscillatus, Fusca Ventures, and Njami and it's really like a mental spiral when you're trying to ID this, but I'll get into that later. <laughs> All right, so what do we currently know about Hyperoleus on Bioko? We know that since the 1800s, there have been two confirmed species on Bioko, again, tuberculatus and oscillatus. And we also know that in 1998, Bob and Jens from the Academy actually went on an expedition to Bioko and they were collecting herbs and they came back with two additional mystery species, mystery species A and B. And provisionally, these two species were identified in the collections as oscillators. Um, but now we sort of suspect that one is HCF Njami and the other is HCF Fusca Ventris. Um, we also know that in 2011, our current creator of herpetology, Reina, went back to Bioko and she observed a mismatched implexus. And this is essentially where two distinct species um, are mating with each other or attempting to mate with each other. So on top here, we see a male oscillatus and on the bottom, there's a female um, CF and Jami. And this can happen in locations or locality, localities where two species are found in like the same area. Um, and this is interesting and really important to note because it can lead to um, hybridization. And hybridization is essentially where two distinct species mate with each other and have an, a successful offspring. So this really lovely picture here is a hybrid between a zebra and a donkey, which is a really extreme example. And this happens in captivity, right? Through artificial breeding. Um, but hybridization can also happen sometimes in nature. So one example is in 2015, Bell and others discovered two species of Hyperoleus hybridizing in a locality where both of the species were found living together. Um, on South Tome, so this island is just south of Bioko. And so if we can find reef frogs that are living in the same location that are hybridizing on South Tome, this could be possibly happening on Bioko as well. Which brings me to my research aims. The first one being to confirm the species ID of HCF and Jami and HCF Fusca Ventris. And I'm doing this through genetic analysis, um, and, uh, analyzing mating calls, and also looking at color variation. 
So I sequence two genes um, from hyperolius, the first one being 16S, which is mitochondrial DNA, and 16S is used to confirm the species ID. And I also sequence a nuclear DNA gene, CMYC. And essentially, um, the concept here is that if you have Njami for 16S, um, like one specimen comes back as Njami for 16S, but it's oscillators for CMYC, that means that they're hybrid. And so uh, in total, I sequenced 99 specimens. And the map here on the left, you can see, is a map of Bioko and the distribution diversity of the hyperolase frogs that I sequence. So blue is Njami. Yellow is oscillatus. Um, the two colors here is Fusca ventris. The green is tuberculatus. And both Fusca ventris and tuberculatus um, were previously sequenced. So I did not sequence these. Um, but this map here really gives us this like first look at the diversity of hyperolis frogs on Bioko because not much about um, their diversity or distribution is known um, in this place. OK, so. Here's a phylogeny of the Hyperolidae family. And basically here, what I did was I took my sequences of Fusca ventris and Njami and I put them into a phylogeny tree with reference sequences of Fusca ventris and Njami. And the divergence levels here are basically saying that for Fusca ventris, our, ref our, our sample, our sequence was 99.3% similar to the reference sample. And for Njami, it was 99.8% um, similar to the reference sequence. So this tells us that we do, in fact, have the correct species ID for Fusca ventures and Njami. All right, so after that, I made a haplotype network of the sequences from Bioko for Njami and also um, sequences from the other locality where Njami is found in Cameroon. And we basically, this network is showing so the, each of these colored circles are showing individuals that share identical sequences. And each line separating or connecting the circles is one mutational difference. And the black dots, the small black dots, are basically intermediates between um, each sequence. And so we also count that as a mutation. But these, were not, these black dots were not observed in my data set that I put into this network. So we can see how the two individuals from Cameroon are pretty identical to each other. There's only one mutational difference between the two. But for our samples from Bioko, there's quite a bit of genetic variations and genetic diversity um, between our samples. So this is a really important finding because um, Njami is only found in southwestern Cameroon and then now in Bioko. Um, so it's really cool to think about what we can do with this information in terms of like conservation efforts and like really like trying to save Njami if <laughs> anything goes downhill with them. <laughs> and I, I forgot to mention that the circles are scaled to the number of individuals that are in, um, that have the identical sequences. And so this is a haplotype network for Fusca ventris, and it's in a network with um, se reference samples from Nigeria, Cameroon, and Ghana. And you can see that it's most genetically closest to um, reference samples from Nigeria. And you can also see how um, the Bioko Fusca ventris, um, which is this circle, this last circle on the right here, um, don't have genetic diversity. So they're all clustered in this one little circle here, unlike um, Njami. So the next thing I did was I analyzed mating calls. Um, so these two graphs here are oscillograms. Um, of the Bioko Njami and the Cameroon Njami. Cameroon Njami being the ones that are already confirmed to like have existed. Um, so just share these meeting calls. So you can kind of hear how the Njami sounds like a little clicking sounds. And this is the Cameroon Njami. Okay, so on the telegrams, you can sort of like keep track of like the meeting calls. Um, but basically on the y-axis, we have amplitude over time in seconds. And each of these little like lines are a note. And for Njami, there's one post per note. And that's important later when we look at um, oscillators. 
But comparing these two to each other, the meeting calls and the oscillograms, um, is just basically further confirmation that um, we have um, Njami on Bioko. And here I was looking at color variation um, in our specimen collections. And this is sort of just like a way to back up the genetic data I, that I had. And in the yellow box here, we have reference um, pictures of Njami. And you can see how there's like sort of this like age pattern on his back or like this like disconnected pattern. And there's like multiple variations on the theme here. Um, this is not all of it, <laughs> this is just some. And you can imagine like, it's like very difficult to like try to pinpoint like what this is, like who are you? So our specimen here is genetically a Njami, but like just looking at it at first glance, you're like, oh, well, it doesn't really look like anything that we've like seen, right? Um, so it actually kind of looks like an oscillatus here um, which has two dorsolateral stripes running down its back and also this like iconic like V on the snout. Um, but if you look at the specimens that we have in the collection, right, there's no lines, there's no V, like who are you? What's your name? Um, and to make it more confusing, oscillate this kind of looks like Fusca ventris, right? So it has two dorsolateral stripes. Um, it doesn't have the little V on the snout, but um, our specimen that we had didn't even have the lines, so we were really unsure about like what this frog was. And it was really the reason why Bob, Jens, and Reina have been so confused about these frogs. And it's it's sort of like a nod at like we really need like genetic tools, like um, sequencing and like also other data to like back up um, like our findings because. Um, if you were like really want to understand like the genetic diversity of hyperolius. All right, and that takes me to my second research goal, um, which was to determine whether HCF and Jami and H oscillatus are hybridizing. And here you can see haplotype networks for the 16 SNCMYC genes for both Njami and oscillatus. And there was no evidence of hybridization between Njami and oscillatus. What we want to look for is little circles, colored circles that have both colors in it because a hybrid would be sharing DNA from both Njami and oscillated. So you'll have a circle that's kind of like a pie chart, right? Both yellow and blue, but we did not see any mismatch sequences here. So Njami and oscillates were not hybridizing. And this makes a lot of sense because if you look at the phylogeny and you look at oscillates and Njami on the tree, they're very distant and they're not really close relatives. On the other hand, the two species that were hybridizing on South May are very close relatives. So um, it makes sense from like an ecological perspective and a genetic one that these two would be hybridizing and the other two would not. And also uh, the mating calls for Njami and oscillators are very different. Um, and this is sort of like an isolating mechanism to keep um, one species from interbreeding with another. So I'll play the Njami call again, and you can hear the oscillator song. And here's the oscillators. Right, so the oscillatus one is more like a trill, so there's several posts per note, but the Njami one is just one post per note, so very different from each other. So in conclusion, um, we found that the two mystery species are indeed H Njami and H Huscaventris, and also that H Njami and H oscillatus are not hybridizing on Bioko Island. Which takes me to my future directions. The first one being to sample the northern half of Bioko Island. Um, there's a lot of like, pitfalls and like feasibility here because the northern half of the island is a military base so it's really hard to like get permits and stuff to collect frogs but doing so will give us a better idea of the diversity of hyperolius on Bioko. The second thing to do would be to go back to um, 
the location where the Fusca Ventures were found. So only three of Fusca Ventures were ever found in Bioko. And they were actually found in a town called Luba, which is a port town. So there's like ships coming in and out um, from the continent to Bioko. Um, and we also saw how this frog was very genetically close to the ones in Nigeria. So it brings up the question like, were these frogs introduced? Like how did they get here? Um, so just going back and sampling that and seeing how closely related they are to the Nigeria samples. Um, the next thing on the bottom left here is to um, analyze how the Anjami and Oscillatus frogs are partitioning space ecologically. We know that they're found in the same localities, but like what are they doing to like, you know, share resources or like um, prevent competition and things like that. And the next thing is just seeing how closely related the Anjami and Bioko Island is to the ones in Cameroon. Um, and then lastly, Bioko is home to volcanoes. So um, another thing we could do is look at the relationship between volcanic activity and the genetic diversity of frogs. Um, you're probably wondering why in the world we care about frogs. So I'm gonna take a moment to like zoom out and like look at like the big picture here. Um, amphibians are one of the most threatened groups by extinction. However, knowledge and distribution of knowledge of distribution and diversity of amphibians in tropical places like Bioko um, is really incomplete. So basic information about where they're found, how many species there are, is really important not only for frog and amphibian conservation, but also for the integrity of the tree as a whole, because like after all, all of life is connected in one way or another. So with that, I'd be happy to take questions. Mm -hmm. Do you think possibly the pigment in the specimen was leached out during preservation, and that's why it's a little harder to compare it to like living animals? Mm -hmm. So the question was, is it possible if the pigments in the frogs in the collections leached out? Um, and it, it really is possible. Um, the frogs, the Fusca Ventures frogs, I think, were from 1998. So they've been here for a while. They're old. <laughs> so uh, originally the frogs, like, um, in the pictures in the beginning, you can see how they're like bright green. Um, you can clearly see the patterns, but over time, you know, the pigments can leach out and then it, it might be harder to see the, the, the variation in, in color, but that's a big possibility, yeah. Yes. Uh, what documentation of the uh, amphibian collection do you think would help further identification in the future? Like, do you have any ideas for how future scientists could potentially uh, keep better records of the collections and make identification labor easier? Mm -hmm. um, so the question was, is there a way to like better preserve collections to um, like for scientists in the future to look back? Um, I don't have like a direct answer for that or like a clear answer, um, but I know that like frogs have to be kept in like a wet collection. So, um, I don't know, maybe like someone has like a breakthrough with like methods of preserving frogs. Um, but yeah, I, I can tell you sure. You think photography might be a benefit? Photography, photography in the field um, yeah, is a great idea. Um, sometimes it's really difficult though. And when you're like out in the field, you know, in like the middle of the rainforest, <laughs> you have to pop out your, your cannon or something. Um, but yeah, um, also pictures, pictures would be really helpful. Yes. Are these frogs apismatic? Uh, I'm sorry, what's that? Warning coloration. Are they poisonous? No, they're not. Yes. What was your um, favorite experience like on the work for projects? Oh. <laughs> um, I think just really like seeing everything come together. Um, like I did all the sequencing first, and then I did the calls and then I did the color patterns last. So just like 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 concatenating all of this data and like seeing like how everything ties to each other. I'm like, oh wow, there's like this breakthroughs here. <laughs> um but yeah, just seeing everything come together. But I, I really enjoyed like all the different aspects. Um I really got like a, a piece of everything I think.
Okay, our next presentation is from Amy Jo Torbett uh, from City College of San Francisco, who's gonna be talking about how to use visual storytelling to disrupt assumptions about who belongs in science. Uh, and she was advised by our um, wonderful digital engagement team, uh, Laurel Allen and Ariana Tarajan. All right, thank you for the introduction. Um, once again, yeah, my advisors are Laurel Allen and Arya Natarajan, and yeah, let's just get started. So, um, my interest in visual storytelling comes from the fact that I'm a cinematography major. Um, I got a lot of my inspiration initially from a website called Jungles in Paris, which you can see on the right. Um, I found that oftentimes in science, um, I found that often in science, um, there's a lack of personal and emotive storytelling. Um, and that was my inspiration that I found in Jungles in Paris to bring to my summer project. <clears throat> so yeah, one of my first goals in storytelling the summer was to present science in a deeply personal and human way. I think that people become scientists for emotional reasons based on their personal experiences and identities. I believe it is important to showcase such diverse personal backgrounds as they ultimately make science that much stronger. Secondly, I hope to contribute to making science feel more accessible through my project. And lastly, I hope to highlight that not all paths to careers in science are so clear cut and that science should be open to anyone no matter where they are in their lives. So my initial plan was to feature three emerging scientists via video interview. Um, these features would focus on the individual perspectives that each scientist brought to their work. And additionally, I plan to focus on written um, and photo biographies for the remaining cohort. So one of the main challenges I found this summer was in time management. I realized that it takes a lot of time to respectfully tell even one story or share even one story, much less 10. Um, my second challenge arrived when I realized that my interviewing techniques needed a major upgrade. My questions were impersonal, uh, especially in the beginning, and thus I was finding it difficult to connect with individuals and their stories in a personal way, much less to tell them in a personal way. Some smaller challenges I faced were in realizing that rainforests, even the one in the bubble, can be quite unpredictable. <laughs> um, an overheating camera, a foggy lens, there's Carl, San Francisco's fog, um, and screeching macaws who were hoping to give their two cents mid-interview all presented a challenge in the editing room. One of the challenges of my camera overheating and shutting down was that my audio and video were no longer synchronized. So some solutions to those challenges. Um, to be able to better manage my time, I decided to focus on one story instead of 10. Additionally, I asked for input on interview questions from my advisors, Laurel and Aria. I found that opening up questions by broadening their scope allowed the people I was interviewing to feel more comfortable and more likely to share their personal experiences with me. Also, I was able to work with the footage and audio I had by learning various editing techniques, such as matching audio waveforms in Premiere with help from technical support um, from Nick Perez. This solution is also known as fixing it in post. Okay, so introducing Cecilia's story. I was born in Berkeley, um, raised in San Pablo and also in Albany, California. I have a lot of um, roots in South America, but also very much an East Bay kid. My parents fled the, um, the dictatorships of Pinochet and Videla in Chile and Argentina. Once those dictatorships ended, like I was able to go with my family to their home countries. Um, and so a lot of my childhood memories of those places are really precious to me. My great grandfather was a fisherman and, um, you know, my family there is very working class. They're very kind of salt of the earth people. Um, so yeah, like that going to Chile 
at a very young age was super important for me to have that connection to my culture. My father um, majored in agricultural engineering in the University of Chile in Arica, which is like in the far north, in the very arid desert of Chile. So coming to America, um, despite having that degree, he wasn't able to actually work in that for almost 20 years. He was a waiter, but he did work a little bit with the UC um, Berkeley with a Professor Altieri um, in at the Guild Tract. And so some of my earliest memories are of running around cornfields and running around uh, tomato fields um, while they were doing integrative pest management research with ladybird beetles um, and aphids and seeing how they could reduce the amount of pesticide use in agricultural settings. Um, and so, yeah, literally sitting on my father's lap looking at ladybird beetles eating aphids and, um, you know, so that was like really formative in terms of how I saw like the problems that happen in agriculture or in nature and, and how there are natural solutions to everything. I was always stuck in the, like, um, just always scrambling for housing. Like, I moved 15 times in five years and um, just could never find a place to call home. And it was really tough because, you know, for any, like, you can't build a five year plan when you're worried about what's going to happen in the next two months, six months. It feels really. It feels really hard when you're trying to survive, um, you know, paycheck to paycheck and not able to to do the things that your soul and your heart are calling for. Um, and, you know, I think it's it can be really easy to tell somebody to follow your dreams, but when, you know, they're working a nine to five job uh, for minimum wage um, and it's just not cutting it, like you have to have to kind of forego some of those things sometimes. I do feel like because I haven't been able to really root into any stable ground, um, it's definitely stunted me in some ways, but it's also caused me to grow in other ways, you know. Um, I think I've really diversified my skill set because of that inability to create kind of the most fundamental stability. Like I've had to you know, I have so many different skills. I can, you know, I do like health education and sex education. I'm, you know, I know a lot about plants. I used to do landscaping. I, you know, I have like a bunch of different skills to try and build that stability. Not having stability in my immediate home environment has definitely caused growth in other areas. Within a year, I'll be able to transfer, and I'm hoping to transfer to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Um, I'd like to major in their soil and environmental science um, degree until doing the summer systematics internship. Like, I didn't think about, you know, graduate programs. I didn't think that PhD level stuff would be in my realm of possibilities. I can, I can see myself doing that now. Um, I can see a path towards that. I'm not afraid of it. And, at this point, like I, I feel like it's all within reach finally. So that was my video project. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Um, so that was that. Um, throughout the summer, I've learned lots. And here are a few of my main takeaways that I'll bring with me forward. Um, I learned that project management through focusing on one video biography instead of 10 was um, the best way to go for me. <laughs> um, I learned to ask for help from my advisors, Laurel Allen and Arya Natarajan. Um, and I learned to ask myself the question, how can I make my interview questions more human and personal? I learned that interviewing is not necessarily intuitive. It requires forethought, empathy, and skill. Um, 
And one of the quotes from Laurel Allen that I really liked and have on the upper left of the screen is, it's a human endeavor to tell human endeavors. So special thanks to Cecilia Alvarado, obviously, for um, allowing me to um, hear of her story and to um, share her story in a video format, as well as her advisor, Dr. Sarah Jacobs. Um, thank you to the SSI program directors, Dr. Lauren Esposito and Dr. Rebecca Johnson. Thank you to my advisors, Laurel Allen and Arya Natarajan. Thank you to Nick Prez, as well as Molly Mickelson for editing assistance. Thank you to Lynn Bonobo, for Bonomo, sorry, for coordinating our labs and programs this summer. Thank you to all other SSI mentors and students who helped me along the way. And thank you to the National Science Foundation for the opportunity to present um, and participate in the summer's RU program. And does anyone have any questions? These are also photos I was doing uh, social media this summer. So these are some photos that I've taken <laughs> of you all. <laughs> Any question? there, there's a question uh, in the chat mm -hmm. um, from Skylar who asks, what do you think is so valuable about revealing the human side of science and scientists? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, what I find valuable, oh, the, so the question from Skylar Knight was, what is so valuable about revealing the more personal and human side to science and the scientists who do science? It's a big question. Um, it's going to be obviously very much my opinion, um, but I think it's very useful to show people's backgrounds um, in order to show that there's diversity in science or there is, should be more diversity in science. Um, and it's different, I think it's different for everyone. So, yeah. Yes, Kate. Um, my question is, what steps did you take to make your interview questions more personal? Like, you know, mm -hmm. starting out like, oh, this is what I was imagining, but then what did you do to get to that? Yes. So the question was, what steps did I take to pers to make my interview questions more personal? Um, I think opening up questions more is also is a very good step when interviewing someone um, to not go in too targeted and to really not go in with, um, despite how much um, knowledge you might have of whoever you're interviewing previously. Um, it's a good idea to just go in and, and let them open up and tell their own story instead of um, trying to narrate it yourself. Um, that's something that I've learned as well as asking questions. Mm, yeah, just really broadening them, I think was what helped me and humanizing them like the syntax. The question shouldn't be so higher level to where they don't feel like you're having a sort of a conversation basically in an interview. Um, so just making them more conversational and more human, literally just in, in, in how I word them. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Um, you mentioned that, that you thought empathy was a really important aspect. Mm -hmm. And I wonder like, how, how do you, how do you, how does one become more conscientious of empathy or more empathetic? Mm -hmm. Like on the, on the backside of the camera. Mm, 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 mm. So the question was, how does one become more empathetic as an interviewer? Mm. I think interviewing by nature is very much an observation. Um, so perhaps really just sitting back and, and listening to someone is the, is what I got out of the, um, that was my biggest lesson, was just to really um, quiet any pre, I don't know, just to just let, let someone speak and tell their story and, and really listen. Um, not only is that a great um, trait when getting to know someone, but it really is useful when you're creating a story that is personal. 
and hopefully, you know, being respectful. Um, empathy is really something that I've worked on this summer. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Great. All right, thank you. All right, thanks so much, Amy Jo. Um, oops, I have the wrong side of my picture. Sorry, everyone. Um, next up, we have um, Hazmig Nar Narguizayan um, from Cal State University Northridge, and she will be talking about reconstructing a late Miocene Northern California marine community, testing the responses of marine biodiversity to warming oceans. Hazmig, you're up. Okay. Hello, as Rebecca said, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm Hasmin Narguzian. I'm a microbiology major and a geology minor at California State University, Northridge. And this summer, what I did as an intern, SSI intern, was work with Dr. Peter Rupnerine on reconstructing the Northern Californian marine community, paleo community in the late Miocene, as well as testing and modeling the marine biodiversity response to warming oceans. So again, just to reiterate what I was saying, because it's a mouthful, um, <laughs> we reconstructed the Northern California marine paleo community of the late Miocene. And in doing that, we were trying to examine the stability and resilience of paleo communities to state changes, for example, temperature increasing. So when was the Miocene? Um, so it was 10.4 to 5.3 million years ago. Um, and our collections from the late Miocene period contain mollusks, brachiopods, and arthropods. So these are just examples of mollusks. Um, the majority of our collection consisted of mollusks. So these are bivalves and gastropods, so clams and snails. Um, I took these images as we were also digitizing our data. Um, so the fossils that we were looking at were collected from Sonoma County, Wilson Grove, from this quarry called Bloomfield Quarry. Um, keep in mind, this is what the quarry looks like right now, but during the late Miocene it was underwater as we're looking at marine paleo community. Um, and it's about an hour and a half north from Cal Academy Science. So why are we doing this? So in order to comprehend how modern community works, we need to understand how these communities initially emerged and how they functioned and understanding the relationship biodiversity has with ecological resilience. And we are also establishing historical baselines that are independent of human interactions. So how do we do all that? So um, I first made a taxonomy listing and I did all the fossils that we had in our collection. Um, this is what my workstation looks like for a month. We had about 14 drawers filled with unidentified fossils um, with a total of about 500 individual fossils. And what I found was 50 different species and four of those species being extinct. Only four being extinct is a good sign because it just shows how our this community is similar to the community modern day, present day. Um, so I have zero previous knowledge about anything mollusks and fossils or IDing anything. So books, um, after meeting with Dr. Peter two times, my entire desk was filled with books. It overwhelmed me at first, but they were the best resource. Um, I also use websites like Worms and Sea Life Base. It was very difficult IDing these fossils because the names of these species change like all the time. So it's hard to find the accurate information for each species. This is what the taxonomy listing looks like. Um, we use Excel. So we included the drawer ID of where the fossils are placed in, the locality where it's from, the class, family, uh, species ID, genus, specific epithet, the author date, and then whoever it was ID'd by. Most, some of the fossils were ID'd by previous scientists that were also looking at this collection. So those are the names. Um, this is just a look at how I digitized everything. This is like the photo lab. Um, that's the, like an example of what an um, ID label would look like. 
Um, and then those are just close-up images of the specimens I found were coolest. After the taxonomy listing and IDing all those fossils, we made a guild web. So what, what's a guild? Um, it's grouping species that have similar roles and functions within the community, and they play the same role within that community. Um, so that's an example of a guild web. This is my first draft of a guild food web. Um, my mind was just not working that day after doing all this. Um, <laughs> My eyes were just like done. Um, so <laughs> we had to place the taxa in its appropriate guild, which is a box. Um, and then the arrows point in the direction of energy flow. So for example, you see microplankton all the way to the left, bottom left, and then an arrow pointing to epifaunal filter feeders, and then an ar arrow from that box to browsing carnivores. So that's just the energy flow through each guild. And then this is the Excel version of my food web draft, guild draft. Um, and it, it again includes species placed in its appropriate guilds. And then in this sheet, we added body size and centimeter, and then the species richness, which is the number of species in each guild. And then lastly, we were able to formulate a food web based on all the data that I collected. This is what the food web looked in the beginning, again, with the arrows pointing in the direction of energy flow. Uh, we used Jeffy, Geffy. Um, my laptop did not like that software. It took a couple hours <laughs> for it to actually work normally on my laptop. Um, and in this food web, you see that we added um, guilds that were not in our community, but were present at the time. So we brought in marine mammals, uh, predatory fish, stuff like that. And then uh, to clean it up a little nicer, we added silhouette images of species that represent each guild. Uh, I thought this was really cool. It's like my favorite part. Um, <laughs> we used Philopic and Inkscape. I felt like a graphic designer. Um, and so you see three colors. So that just shows that um, in our Bloomfield Cory community, it had three loosely connected subcommunities. Um, and then this is just a predatory adjacency matrix. So on the X and Y axis, it's all the gills that we had. Um, and then wherever you see one is basically that guild preying on the corresponding guild. And then this is another matrix where we added the species richness to it, which is again, the number of species per guild. And then with all that data collected as of Tuesday, we added a new question. So what if we disrupted the primary production for a year as the ocean starts to warm around our Bloomfield quarry? So we're looking at the resistance of the community, which is um, the property of communities, populations that remain um, unchanged when a disturbance occurs. Then we're looking at the community's resilience um, and how resilient, how long it took for it to be resilient, um, which is the ability for it to go back to the state as it was before the disruption. And then if the community reorganized to an alternative state, which is the community coming back after the disruption, but not exactly how it was before the disturbance. And then this is just a closer look. Um, this is a species level food web. What I showed before was again, a guild level food web. Um, again, with a silhouette representing each species, um, shows the energy of flow with all the arrows. And it shows the feeding relationship among the organism, as well as emphasizing the influence of populations on growth rates with other populations. So to go back to our question as like, what would happen if we warmed Bloomfield Quarry? Um, so it's something called upwelling, which is the recycling of nutrients from deeper waters to more surface shallow waters. Um, so that's a good thing. But if we warmed the waters, then it would lead to stratification, the, reduce, the reduction of vertical mixing of nutrients, uh, reduction of oxygen concentration, and as well as creating dead zones which is bad. 
Um, so these are our models. So on the left, you see labeled 60% primary productivity disruption. So what we did was we let our community run for about 10,000 days, for 10,000 days, which is up until here. And then for a year, we decreased the primary production by 60%. And then we see the community trying to bounce back, which it did. Um, and this shows how the community, even though it was displaced, it came back to what it was before. So that shows resilience and resistance. Now this one, we just added 20% more disruption. So 80% primary productivity disruption and it took about 7,400 days for it to bounce back. Um, the previous model, it took about 400 days. Um, however, although I said it did bounce back, it bounced back to an alternative state. So we see here how it started and made a full circle, but it came back here, so it didn't completely connect. So um, although it shows resistance and some sort of resilience, it came back to an alternative state, which um, can be good, can be bad. So again, just to reiterate what I said, the results show how um, we observed with how 60% primary production disruption towards our marine payload community um, had the ability to come back to a state as it was before the disruption, displaying its resilience. Whereas when we had 80% primary production disruption, the community was not able to revert back to its original state before the disruption, resulting in an alternative state. Um, and future, so this is just like the stepping stones to bigger projects. So bigger projects can include thousand more models creating a more accurate dis depiction of what these disruptions may lead to, um, playing with the percentages of disruption of primary production. Um, that will give us a better picture of what's ahead for us as well, because a lot of coastlines are, as we all know, warming, global warming, climate change. So um, yeah, I believe by creating models like these, it will help us better understand the history of life on Earth, as well as help further our understandings and predictions for the future with climate change ahead of us. Thank you. Um, so I would also special thank you to my advisor, Dr. Peter Rupnerine, for trusting me with all this work, because I had zero background and all of that. Um, Christine Garcia, she was the geology collections manager. So she really helped me navigate myself through there. Um, and then Dr. Esposito and Johnson for giving me this opportunity. And then Lynn for all the emotional support. <laughs> and then my friends and family as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Yes. How, how did you account for fields that you knew were likely in that ecosystem but were not well represented in the fossil record of the entire world? Okay, so um, the question was how did we know that the, the gills that we brought in that weren't present in our collections were there at that time? Um, we used the website PDBD. Um, they it's just a database, they, I'm sure you know, they, it's a database that had all that information already. So I just typed in all the different time periods that were within the Miocene and in that location. It had the localities that we were looking at. So yeah, so we had a bunch of um, sea lions, whales, we had a megalodon shark, that was pretty cool. Um, a bunch of other sharks and predatory fish. So yeah, we used PDB for all that. Yes. Besides 100% disruption in the primary production, do you think there's a level between 80 and 100 where the community wouldn't be able to bounce back at all and everything would just like die off? I do feel like that's, a po okay, so the question was, um, <laughs> so our modeling went only up to 80% and if we think that between 80 to 100%, if all those, that if that community would just have died off and not 
come back in any shape, way, or form. Um, I do think that's a possibility that maybe I feel from the models that we see, we saw, we like look closer in, which we didn't show here just because it's a lot. Um, I feel like maybe above 85, 90%, it would be just catastrophic. Um, hopefully it never gets to that point. Um, but yeah, I, I, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, there's a question from Chrissy Garcia uh, who says, why did you choose to build your food web using guilds rather than individual species? And how did you decide which species belong to which guild? Okay, um, so we chose a guild web for, wait, what was the first part of the question? The first part? Yeah. How, how did you, this, how, why did you use guilds instead of species? Okay, so we use guilds instead of species because we were looking at the ecological resistance. So guilds is just the whole ec ec ecosystem, basically. So that's why we chose guild web. We did the species web later on, completely last minute. <laughs> um, and how I found, how I figured which species goes into each food web, um, we also, in the taxonomy listing, it's not shown because it's just such a wide variety of information that we collected. Um, I also collected the diet of each species. Um, so if it was a filter feeder or suspension feeder, it would eat microplankton or microbenthic autotrophs. So yeah, again, using the databases, I found out the diets of each species. Yeah. Hey, like, I had a question about, so it looks like, um, obviously you were working with marine organisms, and I was just wondering if there have been any like trends that you had seen with terrestrial systems and like this like, resiliency, because even when it didn't come back exactly to where it was, it was still quite close. Mm -hmm. I was just interested in if you had any insight into that. Um, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know much about terrestrial because in the past I've always worked with marine communities in general even if it wasn't a project like this but from Natalie and Haley's presentation I saw how their community bounced back even better in most cases um, so I feel like that is a trend but I I can't back that up with much knowledge right now thank you great job Thanks. thank you All right, we're gonna take a 10 minute break uh, and resume after some refreshments. Huh? <laughs>
Exactly. Oh, she's unmuted. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to our afternoon session of our Summer Systematics Institute Research Symposium. We have three more talks for the rest of this afternoon, um, so let's get started. Um, the next talk will be by Kareem Casada Corey from the City College of San Francisco, and he'll be talking about phylogenetic speciation among Thiruna nudibranchs. All right, come on up, Kareem. Thank you for that introduction, Rebecca. Um, so yeah, hello everyone. My name is Kareem Kasadakori. I'm a student of the City College of San Francisco. Um, and for the summer systematics internship, I've been working with Dr. Terry Gossner in creating a phylogeny of um, uh, an under-researched genus of nudibranchs called Thoruna. And so to start at the beginning, what are nudibranchs? So nudibranchs are marine gastropod mollusks, also more commonly known as sea slugs. Um, and as you can see, they have uh, an array of different shapes, sizes, forms, and colors. Uh, this image actually is uh, a detail of a painting made by a fantastic artist and frequent Cal Academy collaborator, um, Isabella Kirkland. Uh, yeah. So to narrow it down a little bit, this project has been exclusively working with a family of nudibranchs called Chromodoridae or Chromodorids. Now, nudibranchs collectively are known uh, colloquially as the butterflies of the sea, but even among nudibranchs, chromodorids stand out for their fantastic uh, patterns and, and colors and just their vibrancy overall. Um, so yeah, just look at these guys. Oh, and these uh, images have been taken from our own iNaturalist, and so I've credited them to the handles of the people who are um, taking the pictures themselves. So my project has essentially been an extension of the research done by Dr. Gosselner and Dr. Rebecca Johnson, who is the co-director of Citizen Science, as well as our own leader of the SSI program, co-leader. Um, so as you can see here, figure A uh, is a tree that they based on Dr. William Rudman's work in 1984. Uh, and figure B is a modified tree from an earlier Johnson and Gosselner uh, paper from 2001. Now, the reason why I'm showing you guys this is because these are phylogenies created M exclusively from uh, morphological data. So they didn't really take into account much uh, genetic data. Um, in 2012, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Gossner went about creating an updated classification of Chromodoridae, which included genetic data, which we can see right here. So I know this is a lot and we're only for our purposes gonna be looking at a small section of this tree. Um, but this was basically the result of all of their um, genetic work on the genera that fall under Chromodoridae. So finally, for my summer project, we have gone from all of that previous work to look at Thuruna specifically. Um, you can see just how interesting looking this genus is, and it's worthy, uh, it's worthy to note that they're especially tiny compared to other nudibranchs. Uh, they can be from just a couple of millimeters up to at biggest only a centimeter, centimeter and a half. Um, and so you can see with the little diagram there uh, that they have gill plumes, they have the back, what we consider the back being their mantle, underneath the mantle is their uh, foot, and then the rhinophores, um, which provide them kind of a sense of smell slash taste that give them a sense of the chemicals uh, in the surrounding water. Another feature of the runa that is useful for identification purposes are the radula. Now, radula are the dental plates that they have at the top of their mouth made of the protein chitin. Um, and it's used for moving back and forth to scrape whatever their food source is. Um, they're very useful, morphologically speaking, for species identification because there can be such a difference from species to species in the number of rows that uh, of denticles that they have, as well as the way that the denticles bifurcate. 
and certain parts of the, the denticles there will bifurcate and will split off into more than two um, nubs, depending on where they are on the radula. And so you can tell them apart in that way. Um, and these photos were taken from our SEM here at the lab, the scanning um, electronic micro microscope, electron microscope. Um, however, there is a lot that we don't know about the runa. Like I mentioned, they're a pretty under-researched species. Um, so this is a detail of that phylogram that we've seen earlier from Galsner and Johnson, 2012. Um, and as comprehensive and as, as good as this was, basically there were still some unanswered questions. For instance, you can see these two florins, they were put far apart from each other. So there's clearly something going on there. We were thinking the bottom florins might be actually a furtiva and a true florins is up at the top. Um, so there's still much more work to be done. Um, so specimens continually continue to be collected, even though we haven't done much genetic research since that 2012 paper. And as you can see the distribution right here, um, mostly centers around the Indo-Pacific, which is in that uh, triangle. However, they range from everywhere from South Africa to Hawaii. And so that's what our specimens were coming from. So the methods used for this project have mostly revolved around uh, DNA sequencing. Um, so in our Center of Comparative Genomics lab, I was taking DNA samples from 29 different specimens, um, amplified that DNA for the 16S and CO1 genes, cleaned those genes as much as possible, and uh, continued taking those sequences to get uh, trees and, and more analyzed data that we can have. Now for this presentation, I'm only really gonna be talking about the 16S sequences. That was what we were able to get the most data from. CO1 sequences are still in progress. Um, so finally, here is our Bayesian tree that we created based on our data. Um, as you can see in the far, the, the top left corner, um, we use these Diversodorus and Felomare specimens taken from GenBank um, as our outgroup to kind of root the, the tree. Um, and then further down, we have the Hypsilodorus sequences that we used as a sister taxa to compare with the runa. Um, and there's a lot of interesting things in this tree that we're gonna get into right now. So first off, um, you can see this punicea, this Theruna punicea that we saw, it was of note because from the get-go, it kept being paired with the other Hypsilodorus um, specimens. One side note about Theruna punicea was that it was originally an Hip a Hypsilodorus before genetic work um, made it seem much more likely to be part of the Theruna genus. Um, so what we're thinking is with this particular specimen, it's actually a Hypsilodorus of some kind that was misidentified as a true Punicea. When I took this to Dr. Gosselner, he hypothesized that it was probably Hypsilodorus bullocae, which is right here. However, once we ran some more trees, we saw that they were not put together. So there's still a lot more um, work that we need to do on that to see, to get some clarity on the tree itself. Yeah, so um, now we have a grouping that this one was a little bit messy. So as you can see here and here, we have an unnamed species at the bottom um, and we have a species one. Now they kept getting grouped together, but as you can see on the images below, they're morphologically quite different. The unnamed species is more white in its mantle, whereas the species one is purple um, with purple. So, yeah, Perperpetus and species one, basically they were being put together. However, they're not quite the same genetically, at least from what we can see. Um, and one interesting thing that you can see at the bottom image is that Perperpetus, when seen in its habitat in the Marshall Islands, uh, it does have some variation in the sense that it can be both whitish and pinkish as well as true purple. So what we're looking at is of these four specimens, we might just be seeing one true species. Honestly, that might just be variations of the same thing. So again, once we have the CO1 sequences that'll and concatenate those, we'll get much more clarity on that. But we think we can clean up these, uh, these issues. Um, third, we have an intriguing comb shape. You can see those Africanus and Horologias. Um, now, so these, Africanas, they were um, described as such mainly because of the white 
uh, color of their mantle and then the outer line of coloration on the outside of their mantle. Um, however, true Africanas, which you can see at the very bottom, are much more yellow, yellowish than the orange that we were seeing with these Africanas. But as we saw in the previous slide, you can be you can have a lot of color variation within these specimens. So it's understandable why they're seen as Africana. But after going through these um, trees, it looks like they may have been misidentified and that these are all horologias. And horologias are mainly identified uh, morphologically by their cinch um, coloration on their midsection, which give them kind of an hourglass shape, which is what they get their name from. Um, now for this group, I definitely want to look further into that the Runa Florence is at the bottom because it kept getting um, not being lumped completely together with the top Florins, which we got from GenBank. But more importantly, um, of note is that we have extra conf confirmation that we likely have a brand new species in this Theruna species seven. Um, and so given at every step of the way, they've been shown to be separate from the other known species that we have in our data set. So again, as, as with everything else, we need to do look into it more, more closely, but it's, it's looking for sure that there's a new species right there. Um, so to conclude, going back to the research from before my summer project that uh, Drs. Gosselner and Johnson uh, did, a lot of great phylogeny was created solely through the observation of physical traits. However, a running theme of this project was that morphology on its own can only tell us so much. And so once you add genetics into the mix, it tells you a lot more. Um, and also going forward, because I'm based in San Francisco, I'll be able to continue working the lab, continuing um, to do sequences and creating a little bit more clarity with this genus. So yeah, just want to give some acknowledgments um, for the NSF fund and SSI. This has been an amazing opportunity to get a crash course in genetics work and just marine biology in general. Um, for Drs. Lauren Esposito and Rebecca Johnson, they've been amazing um, and having and creating just a great foundation of support. Um, and obviously Dr. Johnson has provided a lot of the uh, foundation data wise for what I've been doing here. Dr. Terry Glassner has been amazing at kind of keeping me going in a good direction. All the SSI advisors, every time I've had a question or need some clarification, they've been amazing. For Lynn Bonomo, Sam Donahue, and Bonnie Cruz, when it comes to lab work and when it came to doing the programs to run the trees, yeah, they've been so generous with their time and I can't thank them enough. Obviously the interns have been a great group to work with. My family has been amazing um, and very supportive. And then the City College of San Francisco, it's had its up and downs but I think it, it bears mentioning just how crucial having a community level uh, institution of higher education is. Um, so I just want to say all that. So that's my project. <laughs> Any questions? What's your favorite zoo to bring that you studied? Oh my gosh, just of Theruna? <laughs> In Theruna? Um, the first one that I ever uh, subsampled was Theruna australis, and I could probably even tell you the CAS number if I thought for a second. But anyway, um, they're very pretty. I don't think I have a pic. No, actually, that was it right up there. So down there, they're very pretty. They've got these like little dots all along the edge of their mantle in there. Yeah, that was mine. <laughs> Any other questions? So, um, Kareem, awesome, thanks. It was a great job. It's, I love seeing Thuruna. It makes me really happy. Um, Thuruna Australis is one of my favorites as well. Um, and But I had a question about the biogeography, like where these species are found. Do you see any patterns that would help you kind of understand the relations? I know it's not a complete mm -hmm. tree and you need to add co one, but um, you know, I was especially interested in the Africana and Daniele, like those mm -hmm. are found very far apart from each other, and but Orologica and Africana aren't. And so, just wondering if you have any thoughts about biogeography. To be honest, that's something I've thought about a lot. And I haven't, because I've been spending most of my time looking at the genetic side of things, I haven't delved into it too much. So especially off the cuff, it's not something I'd be able to talk to very um, accurately. But yeah, I mean, that's something I want to look more into to see the patterns of that. Because yeah, I think it would tell us a lot for sure. Yeah, sorry, um, I haven't been repeating the questions. The question was working with these 
specimens, especially since they're um, preserved in ethanol, all of their color was bleached. I wasn't working at all um, from the actual specimens that we had in jars. Uh, it was all on the, the pictures of living animals that we had in our database. Um, yeah, so it was just based on the, the quality of the pictures that we had, which were very good. Um, but yeah, we were limited to that. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, hi again, everyone. Um, next up, we have Ryan Arnaud from the University of Texas at Austin, and he'll be talking about the genitalic variation. Oh, I didn't practice saying the scientific names um, of the Selenops Douglas group in the North American desert southwest. All right. Take it away, Ryan. All right, thank you, Rebecca, for introducing me. My name is Ryan Arna, and as you said, I'm gonna be talking about genitalic variation of the Selenops Debilis group in the North American Desert Southwest. So first off, Selenophidae is a family of spiders consisting of nine genera and roughly 200 species. Um, their common names are flatties, wall crab spiders, and wall spiders, and they're called flatties because they are flat, like that. Um, and they're found in the tropical and subtropical biomes around the world. Um, they don't build webs, so to catch their prey, they have to attack their prey quickly. And so they've evolved the fastest turning strike in the animal kingdom. Um, Selenops is the largest genus of Selenopidae, and they're also found worldwide, and that's the, where my species is. So the Selenops debilis group is one species group found in the North American desert southwest, so Baja California, Mexico, Arizona, Texas, and Utah. Um, there are three nominal species of the Selenops debilis group in this area that I have DNA for, and that is Selenops debilis, Selenops neosophilus, and Selenops actophilus. So the image in the center is one from Baja, and then all the other ones are from Arizona. So like most arthropods, they're differentiated by their genitalia, and this is actually pretty problematic because there's a lot of variation. Um, so the female and male type specimens of Debilis were described by Banks in Baja in 1898. Um, later, the Neosophilus types and the Actophilus types were collected. Um, sorry, that was too early. Um, but there was, a there was a problem because this researcher named Muma, he revised the Debilis group in 1953. And when he was doing this, the male holotype was lost. That was originally collected by Banks. So he designated a neotype from Arizona based on form and coloration. But this neotype was found hundreds of miles away from where they're originally collected. So, and it was also within the range of another species. So this is very bad <laughs> and a big problem. And this combined with genitalic variation made things very, very complicated. So here are what the genitalia for each of the type specimens look like. You can see there's some differences in that highlighted blue part as well as on the bottom, you see the parts on the bottom are different shapes. Um, and so I keep mentioning that genitalic variation is a huge deal, but this seems kind of manageable, right? There's differences. Uh, that would be wrong. There, are, <laughs> there is a lot of variation in this group. Um, this highlighted part is called the retrolateral tibial hypothesis, and this is the male genitalia. Um, I'm gonna shorten it to RTA. But on the dorsal part of it, right near the top, you can see that it's different shapes in all of these specimens. And these are all in the same group. There's all these different shapes. There's many more than just 10, but there's only like three described species. So clearly these aren't all different species. Um, and then this is the female genitalia. There's even more variation here because they differ in the spermatheci, which is the little parts that stick up a bit. And also in the posterodorsal fold or the PDF, which are the parts at the end at the bottom that look kind of flat. So the PDF is sometimes curved near the top in the edges. Sometimes it's flatter. The spermatheci is sometimes different proportions, like certain tips are longer than others. And sometimes they're also twisted. So what I was trying to figure out is how does genital shape relate to species? And can genetic data help us give any kind of insight into species boundaries, genital shape, or their relationships with each other? So this is my Bayesian tree. I sequence roughly a thousand base pairs of the mitochondrial CO1 gene from specimens that are collected from the desert Southwest, specifically Arizona and Mexico. Um, this was added to previously collected data from California, Texas, and other localities in Mexico and Arizona. 
Uh, the CO1 data was partitioned by codon in Model Finder and checked for stop co codons in Mesquite. And I conducted fast likelihood analyses in RaxML IQ and IQ tree, and also Bayesian analyses, as you can see here. Uh, there's 64 taxa. And what we found from this is there are five female morphs and two male morphs. Um, and so at the top, we have the outgroup. And this is different, more distantly related specimens that are supported by previous analyses um, by my advisor, Sarah, in her previous work. And so as we can see in this tree, there's two major well-supported clades. That's what the white dot is. Um, and there's another clade that's less well supported, but it's within the Devilus clade that is near the top of that clade. And so this could be potentially be a different species, maybe Actophilus, but we're not quite sure because it's not super well supported. Um, but what we do know is that most of the specimens from Baja and from Arizona are, dis are distantly related and they're found in separate clades. So here's a close up of the Neozophilus clade. Um, all of the Baja specimens were identified as Neozophilus and they're related to each other. Um, there are also some from Arizona that are also Neozophilus. You can see on the map as well. Um, so it seems that Neozophilus is distributed in Arizona and Baja. Um, there, are, there aren't as many morphs in the male genitalia, so that makes it a little bit more manageable and we can tell the difference between them. Um, and so we're pretty confident that Neozophilus is a distinguishable species. And this is a close-up of the Devilus group. Um, their Arizona specimens were identified as all three species, Actophilus, Neozophilus, and Debilus. Um, But Actophilus and Debilus have overlapping uh, distributions on the map. So, but uh, variation, gen genitalic variation, isn't more or less common here than in Baja. So it's unlikely to be a hybridizing zone. Um, Actophilus may not be its own species. It could just be misidentified with Debilus or Neozophilus, but I'm still not quite sure about that one. Um, what's really interesting is this orange morph was found, um, we have specimens found in Mexico and Arizona, so pretty far away from each other, but they're the same morph and they look like the Actophilus type. So even though this top clade isn't very well supported, they're still pretty distantly related to each other. And it shows that variation within the species doesn't seem to uh, differ more, it seems to differ more than variation um, between species. And so what's up next is I have some new samples from Utah and Texas. Texas could likely be Actophilus, which is good because we don't have a lot of genetic data for that yet. Um, and Utah is exciting because we haven't had like any specimens collected from there yet. Um, so in conclusion, we still aren't really sure how many species there are. There could not be three species, or there could be three. Um, <laughs> uh, some of the male and female type specimens may be mismatched. And what we do know, though, is there are more interspecific morphs than interspecific morphs. So many more morphs within a species than between species. So I would like to thank you all for listening and also thank these people and institutions for their support, especially Dr. Sarah Cruz, my advisor, who helped me every step of the way and also Lynn Bonomo, who was there for me late at night in lab. <laughs> and also Dr. Lauren Esposito and Dr. Rebecca Johnson for being the reason why I got this amazing opportunity. So now I'm gonna open it up to questions. Yes. Genes besides just CO1 would help better differentiate the three different potential species from each other? Or do you think it would just be extra information and not quite so helpful? I'm not quite sure about that. I don't know. Right, you? So you said the um, males in Baja have less morphological variation than in other regions of the southwest of southwestern United States. Is that just within the the Pop, the Apophysis region on the male genitalia? Um, no, there's like other regions on the genitalia that vary too, um, okay. specifically the RTA. But there's also, um, I can't remember what the name of it, but there's a part that was in the center, um, the central part within the top of it that also can vary when it's expanded. Oh, okay. So we're also looking at that too. Cool. 
Yes. Uh, I wonder, like, what do you think the solution is for deciding whether or not the types are mismatched? Um, How do you solve that conundrum? Yeah, that's just, <laughs> that just kind of like messes everything up and just makes it more confusing. Um, I'm not quite sure how we solve it. I guess we just have to like see if we can figure that out from all the genetic data or morphological data. Just hope we can find something from that that helps us. But otherwise, it's just really confusing now. <laughs> yes. Um, I don't know if there's like a specific reason, but this is just really, really common within the group is that they have all these individual characteristics and that's just how it is here. Yes. Um, I don't know anything about spiders, but I'm curious about, um, like how magnified the photos are. Like, is, like, could you use like a hand lens and be able to try to ID I think it's too small. Maybe someone really, really skilled could, but they're very, very, very tiny. So the spiders are relatively big. They're about like maybe this size, but those like genitalia are just so, so small compared to on it that they're like a tiny little pinprick. And so I definitely couldn't. Maybe someone really, really skilled could, but maybe. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. Awesome. All right, everyone. Um, next up, we have our last talk. Hi, live crowd. We have one more talk. Um, our last talk will be by Charles Bush from the Oglala Lakota College. And he'll be talking about optimizing scorpion and spider DNA extractions from a century of archival collections. Come on up, Charles. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, today, I will be talking about optimizing scorpion and spider DNA extraction, looking over a century old specimen. So let's see. So to get to grasp this and get a bigger understanding of the big picture, we just wanna know like, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background as to why these type of places are really important. Okay, so you know, being here as an SSI intern, we were given an opportunity to look into the past, a past in the sense of being able to see what type of collections that are really housed here. And so while working and understanding uh, all of the research, the insight, the preparation to come here, we were exposed to different wet labs, dry labs, and you know, just to get a better understanding of the big picture as to like why this is important. Okay, so the importance of this, the history collection is, uh, you know, this, this institution, it, it's funny that uh, this past spring semester, I was like taking a class and it, it mentioned museum based research, right? And like, Yo, it's so crazy because now I'm here. And uh, yeah, this is this is really cool because you get to actually look into like my project is I had to create a time series. So a time series is basically I took these uh, specimens from like the 1910s, 20s, 30s, 40s, all the way up until now, even to present day species. And I was able to just see what type of um, extraction kits work best on each specimen. And this is really important because as an uh, institution like the California Academy of Sciences, you know, there's a ton of research and things happening here any given day. And what most people don't know is there's a ton of data that's just housed here. And basically that was what each of our research was this summer. Each of us was given a task to analyze this data that's here. And for me, this, this was really eye-opening in a sense of, like I felt very special in a way like, being able to go on tours and seeing all the collections and 
having first-time access to all this knowledge that's kind of just kept behind closed doors from the public. Next slide, please. Oh, that one? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right. The use of DNA. So DNA is, is funny because, uh, you know, as I was doing these extractions, I was getting really good DNA readings from only the scorpions, you know, and it's, it's, I think the factor that played the huge, a huge key in this was the, the, how they were housed. So they were housed in ethanol and these little vials with, uh, yeah, ethyl, ethyl alcohol. And it was extremely frustrating because I would like do the steps and I wasn't getting anything for these spiders. But then once I realized like, I'm actually getting legs off of these little these little spiders and trying to run a sequence and like have everything turn out right it it was it was a lot of frustration but it it opened up my eyes to really see like how dna ties into everyone's research and our everyday understanding of how this world works and the process which it goes through even down to a molecular level okay so how can, D, how can we unlock DNA data in collections? That was basically my question that I formulated based off of the data I was given. So methods. My methods throughout the summer were I was given pretty much the wet, wet vials of spiders and scorpions, and I had to choose all these different dates throughout the century and be able to pull off little legs of each of them and run them crush them up, you know, I'm, I'm going into a little bit more detail just because of the folks back home, you know, kind of, I want to give them a glimpse into my everyday life of what I was doing here. And yeah, it was, it was really fun. It was a lot of frustration. It was a lot of aha, like a lot of, a lot of self learning, let's put it that way. And it really just opened my eyes as to like, the forensics behind this, you know, because one of the the things I alluded to is like, you know, that's a, that's a total lie on the CSI shows. Like, yo, we're able to solve a crime in an hour. Mm -mm. That's <laughs> that's. Mm -mm. So yeah, that's. It showed me the process, the steps, and the time it takes just to get a little answer from one of the sequences that we run. And so here was like where I chose some of the time series. It's. I was looking in the arachnology collection. So I was able to go into the collection and look at two different species. Uh, one was, hold on, I, I don't want to slaughter it. These are species from the Bay Area, one spider, one scorpion, and 10 samples for each species, one per decade from the 1920s to the 2010s. And these are the species that I was working with. So I used one leg from each specimen for each extraction. and. The spider is called the, hold on, I'm really blind, so Steatoda grossa. And then the scorpion was Eroctonus mordax. And it's just a little bit of some pictures of my, my life here. <laughs> okay, so here's the materials methods. So basically what I'd done was I used these two DN these three DNA kits. One was a pure gene, one was a DNEasy, and one was a micro. And this little Venn diagram is basically everything that they all had in common. So th they all had in common that they were chiogen kits. Uh, the DNEasy and the micro had in common that, oh, the difference between them, the only difference was the spin column size. And then with the, there was no commonalities between the pure gene and the micro kit. But the difference between the micro kit is we use three times more uh, solution of down to whenever we were like adding buffers and different things into the ratios using each kit. Okay, and so right here, this is some of the processes in which I went through to get my data and reach my conclusion. But uh, figure one is just a qubit, which once we would get the sample crush to a certain uh i guess molecular size like we would we would coat it with something that would fluoresce it and then once it was fluoresced these things would stick to the dna and then we would put the dna into the qubit which would then use uh light and refraction to see how pure the specimen was and then the other 
one that looked at how pure it was too was the image figure figure three the nano drop so this basically we would put actually part of the dna on a little part of the machine and the the machine would tell how pure it was and the gel electrophoresis was basically helping to confirm that DNA was there, that it wasn't just like our DNA in there. And so here's one of the sequences that I ran. And so I compared the DNA sequences to a database of DNA, the GenBake, and compared the results of the three kits using an ANOVA and R. ANOVA is an analysis of variance that shows whether there were differences between the methods that were statistically significant. And right here is just a blast screenshot of one of the 27 sequences that I ran. And the results. So here are my qubit results. I uh, got a beautiful box plot up to the, to the right of it and then to the left of it too. So basically I'm just comparing the different uh, the results, the, the results I got from all three of the kits and I ran it through R and these are the box plots that it gave to me. And these are the results from my nano drop as well. In ANOVA. So basically in ANOVA was used to just see if there were any outliers and to see if any of my data could be compromised by potential numbers that were either too high or too low. And conclusions. Basically, there was no difference in the purity. Uh, the methods may need to be a little bit more refined because I was able to extract some DNA, like I think it was the Dean Easy kit, the most simplest kit. I was able to pull the most DNA out of all these specimens. And while these other two kits were nice, they were like, they're more spendy and they weren't actually viable in the amount of DNA that I was able to extract. So in conclusion, I would say that the Dean Easy being the most cheapest one was the best result statistically. Mini barcodes. So these, this was something that I really didn't know much about prior to this research. And this is actually, I believe we there's one paper that's actually waiting to be published on mini barcodes. So with mini barcodes, these show um, the gene in the mitochondria of the cells. And it, it basically puts like a little barcode on each of the DNA that it attaches to. And with the COI gene that we were looking for, it really helps to identify like what works and what really doesn't work. And it was, it was really interesting, but this was like one of the ones that really frustrated me. And I, I, there was some times where I was like wanting to just walk out like, yo, none of this is working. <laughs> I'm done for the day. But uh, yeah, this this has the potential to open up new doors, especially with DNA. You know, everything that we all done this summer, it's all tied to this DNA sequencing. And with these mini barcodes, I believe this is the future of the DNA sequencing that we were all learning and utilizing throughout the summer. Acknowledgements. Uh, so I also want to acknowledge the National Science Foundation for bringing all of us here and giving us the opportunity to work in an environment like this and to actually be like considered a member. It, it was so fun. Like I, I made a lot of good memories here. Uh, I also want to personally thank uh, my student advisor, Jacob Garno. Like, you are one of the real team players. I appreciate you so much. Like. <laughs> I also want to thank Dr. Lauren Esposito, who is my advisor, and I will always hold her real close. I want to thank Lynn Bonomo, who was the true underdog of this whole summer for each and every one of us. I'm sure we all each are, had our days where we were like, I'm done. How could you do this like every day? <laughs> and I also want to thank Rebecca Johnson as well for being part of the process and just checking in on us whenever like we all had our bad days, we had good days. I also want to thank my college, Ogla Lakota College, for giving me the foundation to, I guess, pursue 
what I really love. And being out here has really opened up a lot for me, especially in a sense of belonging. You know, it, it was that's something that I really struggled with. But yeah, just want to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to those listening at home and each and every one of you here. I wouldn't say 100, I'd say maybe back to about 1958 was the one that actually ran successfully. Like, I think it, with a little bit more refined touch of like the different DNA kits, we could potentially go back even farther and get more, a lot better results than no results. Yeah, it's not really um, a question, it's more of a statement. Um, I was here last year, and just seeing how y'all, like this year's um, cohort, y'all came in like not knowing anything. And it's just been amazing seeing how y'all learned so much and become like professionals in your like, own field. Um, so yeah, I just want to commend on that. Thank you. And there's one question from Skylar who asks, after your work, do you see collections like the academies differently? Oh yeah, I I definitely will look at museums and things from a whole different perspective. Like now I'm going to be like, so what do I got to do to get a VIP tour to know what's really back here? You know, like what you really hiding? <laughs> but yeah, it, it just goes to show that there's just so much data out there and it's sad that it's just sitting there not really doing anything with it. and. I just think more people need to utilize these types of programs because you learn so much, not only about your potential field and career, but also about yourself. You know, coming here, I, I didn't, I didn't think I could succeed here because it was when I found out that I was selected, it was like, oh, like I, I, I'd done this and brushed it off. Like, oh, that looks really competitive. I'm probably won't get in. So it's just really eye opening for everything, the experiences, the people, the, the connections, like, I'm going to cherish this forever. All right, thank you. And, and then, uh, this is a side note. So in true Lakota fashion, I wanted to present a star quilt to my advisor, Lauren. Just want to show my gratitude of appreciation for you by honoring you with this. Thank you, Charles. So I think uh, with with that, our summer systematics research symposium has concluded for 2021. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all next year online or in person. Uh, thank you. Thank you.